weapons, and today we're taking a look at the Hologram Electronics Chroma Console. If you're watching this, and certainly if you're watching this anywhere close to the published date of this video being a few short weeks after the announcement of the Chroma console, you're probably like me in that you've spent the better part of the last year uh, anxiously awaiting what Hologram was going to do next. Uh, for those of you who, like me, are deep in the pedal lore world, um, you probably knew Hologram before the microcosm. You may have known them from or even owned the Dream Sequence or the Infinite Jets, a couple of pretty niche but very interesting and fun devices from this company back before their now flagship product, the Microcosm, really put them on the mainstream, well, you know, the mainstream of our little weird boutique pedal world. But that really is the truth of it. The Microcosm fundamentally not only changed their trajectory as a company, but like in a lot of ways, I feel like really fundamentally changed the pedal world. Uh, the Microcosm became fittingly a microcosm for where kind of like big box arms racy style pedals were going. It was ambitious and feature rich and very polarizing. People glommed onto it immediately and there were long waits to get your hands on one at the outset of it. And then a lot of people burned out on it relatively quickly because they found they just either couldn't or were not willing to engage with it on a level that would allow them to get the necessary sounds out of it. And if you've seen my videos on the microcosm on this channel, and statistically you have if you're here, uh, you know that I am somebody who fiercely believes that the microcosm is one of the best pedals that came out that year. Honestly, I would go as far as to say that the microcosm is one of the best pedals of the past five to 10 years, especially when you factor in its MIDI capacity, the ability to clock it to a DAW to make it a truly like essential piece of my workflow for sound design, for adding flavor and spice to all manner of production, whether it's ambient or even pretty aggressive rock and roll genre touch points. And here we are today talking about the anticipated follow-up to the microcosm, and it is the Chroma console, something completely different. And I, for one, am thrilled with what Hologram has brought to the table here. Not just because I'm unabashedly a big fan of the company and a big fan of what the Microcosm is and has been both for me as an artist, but also for the pedal industry at large. But also I'm a fan of this thing because it shows that they are neither resting on their laurels nor are they trying to kind of like recapture former glory, trying to do the microcosm again. If anything, I, I honestly think that the Chroma console is a fantastic and beautiful kind of like companion piece to something like the microcosm. Uh, if you've watched my content with the microcosm over the last several years on Instagram or here on YouTube, you will know that I use it in conjunction with things like the Chase Bliss and Cooper effects generation loss uh, or the Chase Bliss lossy. Uh, kind of like tape saturation, lo-fi devices, things that offer grit and character, flavor and movement to what would otherwise be beautifully designed but somewhat sterile and uh, laboratorial, is that a word? Sound design elements. The microcosm is not there to create texture, it's there to create shape and to create movement. And something like the Chroma console with its full stereo in and out capacity really does become a beautiful thing to put directly after something like the microcosm. But hear me at the outset here, that is not to say that this exists purely as a compendium piece to those of you who have made the microcosm an essential piece of your workflow like I have. This can be also an all-in-one pedal board solution, a grab-and-go device with MIDI capacity, MIDI clocking presets, and flexible routing. This thing can be your digital drive pedal, your go-to chorus double-tracking tremolo device. It's a pitch shifter, it is a delay, it's a reverb. It is a lot of things, and all of those things it does shockingly well. And I guess that means we should talk about what this thing is and kind of like how it brings effects to the table here. The Chroma console is basically 
four categories of effects, each one having a bank of five different types of effect within that category. So like you have character, movement, diffusion, and texture. And each of those contains a series of kind of like in-kind effects. Character offering up fuzzes, drives, uh, sweeten, which is kind of like this beautiful semi-compressed tape saturation kind of thing, uh, and even your auto swell. Uh, movement is going to have your standard modulations, but also your pitch shifter. Diffusion is going to have a couple different flavors of uh, micro looper, delay, and reverb, as well as a kind of mood style reverse delay, not like a full reverse delay with multiple repeats or a feedback loop, but kind of the thing you're currently playing, playing back one time, which is a version of reverse that I am a really big fan of. And finally, you have a texture bank with everything from cassette compression, basically like broken tape emulation, to a very lossy style digital like RF radio frequency interference degradation, as well as a low pass filter, band pass filter, or high pass filter. But all five of those blocks with their relative controls and everything can be swapped around. They don't have to run from left to right in the way they appear on the pedal. You can run that reverb into a fuzz, creating massive shoegaze tones inside this one thing. You could put that kind of like cassette warbled broken tape sound ahead of your sweetener or ahead of your chorus or vibrato sound. And that isn't even a touch on the fact that this thing also has a short phrase looper built into it as well. This tap tempo that will control your delay speeds as well as your modulation speeds, which by the way, as an aside, also can be controlled with your DAW or external MIDI devices using USB-C up top, which we have to take a moment and I'm just so thankful that this thing has USB-C MIDI clocking. It is a lifesaver for my pedal board. Seriously, I, it's maybe my favorite thing about this device. <laughs> but you've also got a really, really easy to navigate preset system for both saving and recalling presets no matter where you are in your system. And it will save everything, including gestures, which is basically the ability to twist a knob to change effects, to sweep a filter, to change a delay speed or whatever, and have that automate repeating forever, married to your tap tempo, by the way. It's, this thing does everything. It is a culmination in a lot of ways of all of the most fun and imaginative pieces of various hologram devices. And here's the thing where I'm gonna be really, really honest with you, it is, 10.41 p.m. the night before, I'm hoping this video is going to go out. I have already shot almost all of my sound samples for this video. I have already edited almost all of it. And I know that the runtime for this video is currently hovering right around two hours. And so I don't wanna spend too much time talking through all this stuff. I really wanna get into the sound samples. And so let's kind of start jumping into them and we'll kind of switch back to this camera to kind of set the stage as we go through things. And with that in mind, I think the most important thing about this device, and it was true with the microcosm and it's true here now, is I think to get the most out of a device like this, you need to understand the workflow, the control scheme, what everything does on the device itself. So we're gonna go to our pedal board and our sound samples, and we're gonna go ahead and take a look at the actual control scheme of the device. We're going to look at what all of the knobs and switches do, what their submenu controls do, how gestures and secondary functions and saving and recalling presets all work. So let's start by exploring the actual material kind of like analysis of the device. Much like with the Microcosm and with almost any pedal that's going to be perceived as uh, containing any amount of complexity, knowing how to interact with the pedal, knowing how to achieve both kind of like base level functionality as well as kind of more advanced functionality is going to be key and crucial to making it a like seamless part of your workflow. So let's talk about how to interact with Chroma Console. As is was very true with the microcosm, and I think any pedal that kind of offers up anything resembling complexity, knowing how to like smoothly and quickly navigate the device itself is going to be key and crucial to making it a valuable part of your creative workflow. So let's talk about how to interact directly with Chroma Console. The beauty of this pedal is twofold. Number one is, despite its size and kind of like sonic complexity, 
it is actually remarkably easy to navigate around for two reasons. And that is, uh, one, it is just a series of simple and easy to interact with individual effect blocks. And number two, and this is the one that I think is really high value, everything is labeled. And I don't just mean like amount, tilt, rate, amount, that kind of thing, but also having all of your sub menu options labeled as well as, and this is my favorite part, understanding which button combinations activate, which kind of like advanced features, how all being labeled right here is incredibly useful. But let's start with the basics. You uh, have access to your bypass and presets on this side, basically allowing you to tap to activate the pedal and deactivate. And then from here, you can press and hold to activate preset mode, which will then allow you to scroll through perspective presets using this amount control right here. And you can actually have this set up so that you can audition each individual preset as you are cycling through them. And at the end, Press on it again to select the preset that you have uh, recalled. All the presets are blank by default. There are no factory presets in this thing. Uh, rather, you will kind of like fill them up as you go along by kind of like finding combinations you love and saving them. And we will come back around to how to save presets shortly. On the left side, you have a tap tempo, which is incredibly useful for your time-based effects like your tremolo and your uh, various delay engines in here. Uh, and this side also has press and hold for capture, which is just a quick, short phrase looper that you have access to that will allow you to kind of like save quick little bits of audio. All of our engines are bypassed right now, so you're just gonna hear dry guitar. But even in this context, I can strum. And you can hear that it has now saved that little like section of the chord that I had that I had captured. And by tapping it, I can kind of like wipe that memory clean and put something new into it. That captured audio can be placed before or after your effects blocks. And as we get into the routing side of things, we will revisit that as well. So as you heard, the pedal is currently on, but we're not actually hearing anything from the device. And that's because each of these blocks can be independently activated and deactivated. To do so, all you have to do is tap the little button up here and select the, uh, and to turn on individual modules. To change modules, all you have to do is tap to scroll through. The corresponding colors are listed below with uh, whatever color your little like light up button is blinking right there. You can cycle all the way down to turn it back off, basically uh, scrolling down past purple. It will go to a bypass state before re-emerging as red. Or at any given time, you can just press and hold and it will turn off that block, basically allowing you to bring it back to any block you want versus having to scroll from zero back to the one you want. Obviously, the most base level functionality, you're going to have your effect controls up top. Uh, red knobs are going to obviously follow these kind of like vertical channel indication, uh, kind of like visual layout. So your tilt and your amount are going to affect your character control, which are various dry effects, everything from an auto swell up through a couple of like interesting fuzzes. Uh, movement is going to be your modulation bank, your doubler, vibrato, phaser, tremolo, and pitch. Obviously, the added benefit there is that vibrato with this master mix control over here can be a chorus as well. Diffusion is going to be your kind of like first set of like real time-based and wet effects offering up things like uh, various delay modes and a very, as you just heard, a very spacious reverb. <laughs> And texture is going to be kind of like a, generally speaking, a, fi a finishing agent. It's going to be uh, filters, compression, uh, tape degradation, uh, digital degradation, a lot of kind of like ways of kind of like mangling, adjusting, or kind of like adding character to your signal. 
much like your bypass and tap controls. All of these buttons also offer up secondary functionality in the form of these kind of like more advanced controls. So uh, as you see listed here, secondary is going to allow you to tap both the left two buttons to enter a secondary mode and this flashing means we're in secondary where you can start adjusting these kind of like secondary controls things like the effect volume for your kind of like dry circuit or the kind of like drift control for various uh, like modulation engines and that kind of thing for instance let's go ahead and bypass all of our engines except for that big lush reverb <laughs> Going into secondary will give us access to a drift control, which will actually add pitch modulation to the reverb. And similarly, you can go into something like that tremolo in here. And by tapping on both of those, you can introduce a drift control that will add stereo width and some randomization to that trem. And at any given time, if you feel like you've gotten too lost in where all your secondary controls are, pressing and holding those secondary controls will cause everything to flash briefly, resetting all of your secondary controls back to default. And for the record, in this context, default means uh, none. So all of those things will go back to like effect volume will be unity. Uh, sensitivity will be kind of set by your kind of like um, your calibration setting control. And then all of your modulation, all of your randomization, all that stuff will go back to zero in that context. Re-engaging all of our effects, let's go ahead and take a look at the next secondary set of controls using those arcade buttons, and that's going to be your gesture controls. This is a feature that was not in the microcosm, but is pulled from earlier hologram releases. I believe it was in the dream sequence, but I know that it was in the infinite jets because I had that pedal and loved it for a long time. Uh, the gesture control is basically the ability to manually move the knobs on the pedal around but then save those those kind of like movements and have them loop infinitely on their own as automation so uh, for example let's go ahead and play with that uh, tremolo again let's bring that back in we'll go to full wet just for the sake of like a ton of clarity here <laughs> Let's go ahead and enter our gesture control. Everything is flo uh, flashing white. And as I move this, you will see that red knob uh, kind of change in brightness as we, as we kind of like shuffle this back and forth. Press it again to exit. And now you will see that this is taking on a different color than everything else. And it's because it is playing back the recorded movements of my rate changes. <laughs> And this can be done for all of these effects. So I could then go back into it and take the mix of my reverb and slowly drag it up to the top. Let's leave it there for a while. Drag it back. Exit that system, and now you will hear that this is also ramping separately.
And it is worth noting, let's go ahead and pull up our filter really quick, our low pass filter. Oh, and at, a, at any given time, you can get rid of any of these automations by just moving the knob that you have been automating, and it will kind of like break that pattern. So let's go ahead and automate that filter. Leave it wide open, and then very slowly move it down. and then open it back up again. So now you can hear. That filter slowly closing over our signal. But here's the thing, those gesture controls are all locked to your tap tempo as well. So if I tap in a faster rhythm, it will change the speed that those gestures were recorded at. So let's say we, and then, oh, and at any given time, you can also just press and hold both of those as well. to reset all of your gesture based stuff. Uh, so same kind of like if you get too lost and you can't remember what's been modulated and what's been kind of like applied to, you can just kind of press and hold uh, the right two buttons just like you would with the secondary controls to reset back to, back to a normal setting and everything. Um, let's go do one more example to kind of showcase that, that speed change with the tap tempo. So let's go ahead and tap in a really slow uh, delay time and go with this really kind of like slow moving delay. And then go into gesture controls and randomly take that all the way to minimum, leave it there for a second. So we'll get a big like pitch swing. And now you'll hear. And there's a decent amount of time in between when that change happens, but if I tap in, You hear that the frequency of that, that gesture has changed dramatically as well. It's happening way more quickly. And then by twisting that knob, I'm back to back to square one. So, so far we have been interacting with this pedal uh, in kind of linear fashion. You have the kind of default order of things, drive, movement, diffusion, and texture in that order. But there are ways to change that setup as well as a lot of others by entering into the effects setup system. Uh, and to do that, as you can see right here, effects setup is going to be pressing and holding the far buttons on the sides, and that will kind of offer up two different things. One, mix control will allow you to decide where you are putting that capture, whether it's ahead of all the blocks or after all the blocks. So for example, if we put it ahead of all the blocks like this and then exit, we can then kind of play in a chord. <laughs> Enter that and using that mix knob, throw it to the other end of things. 
And now, as you can hear, that audio is not being processed through any of this. But if we capture new audio, it will get captured using all of the effects that were kind of like played into it. And as you can hear, all that is printed into that audio. Basically allowing you to then make changes to the sound you're, you're using, but keep whatever you have captured kind of like as it was. You can also use this kind of global setup, uh, this effect setup right here, to change the kind of filter you are using in the filter over here from uh, band pass to high pass to low pass. And I keep mine pretty much always in low pass because if you know anything about me, you know that I live in the low pass world. Um, and then the other big, super important thing here is the ability to set up uh, the order of operation here. So as you heard, we have currently, we have currently this configuration from left to right by default. <laughs> So say we wanted to dial in that howl sound, that really like fuzzy, crazy thing. And that's obviously breaking up quite a bit, um, but it's also feeding into the rest of this. If you wanted to, you could do kind of like a shoegazy thing in here by opening up that effects processor and going, I want my reverb into my drive, into my modulation, into that texture control. And now, in the moment reorder all of your effects. Let's do that again. Let's do our reverb into our movement, into our drive, into our texture. Let's use that texture as a, as the compressor. Uh, let's go ahead and switch over to that drive control. I just want like a little bit of added grit. I don't want like a ton of saturation. <laughs> Just for added chaos, let's go ahead and grab our pitch, an octave down. So now we have like a really interesting, strange sounding uh, effect that, that processes our reverb into our modulation, which is going to pitch it down, mix 50-50, into the drive for just a little bit of hair, and then the compressor for kind of an overall amount of glue for this sound. So now that we have our sound, let's go ahead and save it somewhere because in a real world setting, this would be very difficult to kind of like f find your way back to this on the fly, whether it's in the studio or God forbid live. So uh, when you have a sound you like, you will tap the, uh, the center two foot switches as seen right here, copy and save. Pressing those two will prepare it for saving. And then you can scroll to your desired preset here. Let's go to uh, just preset two. Let's just, let's not go too far with it. And then press again. 
So now that effect. Has been saved and we can enter our our preset management system jump back to our kind of like base point where we started We are now back to business as usual. But at any given time, you can press that preset control or use MIDI. Jump back to that, and as you heard, it will live audition it for you. find your way back to all of these things. And it's also worth noting that any of your submenu controls and your gestures can all be saved to these presets as well. On this second preset, say we made a couple additional changes like this. Let's go ahead and add some gesture control. Let's get back to that reverb. Let's say that we did some gesture control and played with that rate control a little bit as we went. And use the secondary to add some modulation to our reverb, as well as a little bit of drift here. We now have a slightly more fine-tuned version of this sound. Slightly. Oh, that's right, because we're in pitch, so we're adding like weird pitch, pitch bending stuff. Say you wanted this sound. Let's go ahead and go up again and save it in place there. And so now, it's a little bit of a fine fine tuning thing with this uh, with this amount knob. But now you have your normal. Normal in sarcastic air quotes. And your crazy gesture saved versions of this effect. And that is saving and managing presets. One tiny final note I want to make on this portion of the video is Chroma Console has obviously its own internal tap tempo control. You can see the light flashing on my microcosm next to it. And they will kind of like play in turn with one another. It will, because I have the MIDI clock together with a five pin MIDI cable up top, uh, whatever I tap into my Chroma Console will reflect in holograms, microcosm, or any other MIDI-capable devices downstream of the Chroma Console. But a really nice, small quality of life thing is there is a USB-C cable up top here, or a USB-C cable port up top that is also a USB MIDI interface, allowing me to plug a USB-C cable from my laptop directly into the Chroma console. No external MIDI uh, interfaces needed, and I can use that to take clock from my project in my DAW, which is what we did for the entirety of the intro song in this video, and port all of that information, take all that MIDI clock directly from my DAW or any other source to the Chroma console, which will then in turn pass it downstream to Microcosm, to Mercury X, to whatever else I have on my board that accepts MIDI clock over MIDI. So now that we know how to navigate this device and that you know everything we're going to be doing from here on out in terms of swapping the order of the modules themselves, saving and recalling presets, kind of messing with the gesture systems and everything, I think it's time to really get into the specific sounds. And this is going to be a big portion of the runtime right now. This is going to be 
all of the modules and all of the engines in this device. So let's start walking through those and let's hear what the actual kind of like sounds are in this device with some very fun and strategic kind of ambient wanderings off the path to kind of hear how this thing, like I said earlier, marries so well with something like the microcosm ahead of it. So let's take a look at the effects suite in the Chroma console as individual blocks. Uh, obviously the pedal is divided up into four main sections, red, yellow, green, and blue, being character, movement, diffusion, and texture. Uh, they all share a kind of unified mix control with a submenu control for output level. So starting on our leftmost position, or basically from the first effect block, onward to the last one as kind of factory defined. Let's walk through each of them and their individual components. Starting up with our character block, which could also be considered kind of like the dry effects block with a drive, sweeten, fuzz, howl, and swell control. Let's turn things off with that drive. Here is our clean tone. <laughs> As you can see, we have a tilt EQ and a amount control. Underneath each of those, they have a submenu uh, control being sensitivity and effect volume. So effect volume, which is going to be on uh, all of the blocks going across, is, a, is the ability to fine tune that block specifically uh, so that you can kind of manage the amount of, especially on this block, the amount of gain you are putting out uh, alongside the amount of volume that you are then feeding down the line and onward to the rest of your pedal board. And secondly, the sub control parameter for tilt is going to be sensitivity, which is basically just a way to fine tune even further uh, the pedal's sensitivity to your playing dynamics after you do that kind of initial calibration setup thing. So it's feeling pretty good right now, so I don't think we're going to mess with sensitivity at the moment, but we will kind of revisit it as we get down to swell. Uh, here in this drive mode, we have our tilt EQ, and amount is basically going to be, you know, gain or amount of, or kind of intensity of overdrive. <laughs> Obviously, down at the very minimum, you get just this really nice kind of warm, barely amount of breakup coming out of it. But again, that's where that effect volume control comes in really handy, because say you like that amount of kind of quote unquote clipping in the circuit, but you want to push more volume onward to your amplifier, you can hold down your left two buttons to access your secondary controls and increase that volume output. So obviously right there, you've got kind of like a nice low gain breakup kind of sound. You can get a lot of, a lot of grit out of this. But for a digital overdrive, I do really like this kind of like low point right here. And having that effect of volume as a secondary is really helpful. If you like that amount of clipping, but you do want to hit your amp a little bit harder with this. So what we can do is tap to enter our secondary, increase our volume output. And now when you activate that, that effect block, 
you also get a slight volume boost specific only to this block versus an overall output change, which maybe you don't want. And of course, conversely, you can also use that to reduce the overall output of this particular block. So say you want to kind of like add a bunch of grit, but you don't want to hit the amp harder. You can actually slightly reduce your output. Which could basically allow you to do that, get a little bit more gain out of it without changing your output. Okay, and press and hold that to reset your uh, secondaries completely. And of course, you have that tilt EQ up top, allowing you to kind of create something a little bit more mellow sounding. Cut some lows, boost some highs, and get something a little bit raggedier. is the drive. Uh, it's a nice, straightforward, even keeled, especially down at those lower settings, really comfortable overdrive sound. Moving down now to Sweeten, which is going to be more of a saturation and compression style block. You're not going to get a bunch of like added breakup and stuff. Instead, you're getting something that kind of feels more like maybe tube saturation uh, or tape saturation with that slight bit of compression that comes along with it. So let's take that back to minimum, disengage it. I really like Sweeten for uh, kind of adding a little bit of added character to um, to uh, stuff stuff like the microcosm ahead of it because you're not adding a ton of extra clipping, but you are getting something really cool. So let's go ahead and spin up a kind of big ambient mosaic-y kind of thing from the microcosm and then just slowly sweeten up the sound. Look, sometimes everybody uses Mosaic D, it's fine.
And of course we can use that secondary control to tamper down some of that volume. Even outside of volume, just what a difference that makes. and all that reverb stays intact. It's really something cool. That sweet and control is, is great for that hair of compression and that kind of just general presence that it offers up. And it allows you to make use of that tilt control uh, in a very kind of beautiful sounding way. Almost, I almost said sweet sounding, but that's too on the nose. Uh, rather than that drive, fuzz, or howl, uh, sweeten is going to give you access to that tilt EQ and a little bit of added love right there, which is really something special. Moving on down to our fuzz. To pull off a, uh, a, uh, a digital fuzz takes some doing. Obviously, this fuzz is going to feel a lot like a kind of like blown out, broken speaker uh, fuzz. It's not going to be super modern or pristine or anything like that, but it is very characterful in a very cool way. And it is a good opportunity to bring in that mix control a little bit for blending some clean tone back in to kind of give this a little bit of balance. Okay, jumping down to this green fuzz. This is going to be a very kind of like vintage voiced style fuzz. Uh, Tilt EQ is going to go a long way in managing some of the weirdness of this very broken speaker sounding digital fuzz. Uh, but I like it mostly at the kind of more extreme side of things. But this is also a great opportunity for us to bring in that mix control. Blending in a little bit of our dry signal will go a long way in making this fuzz feel a little bit more human.
Let's take this uh, fuzz as an opportunity to play with that headroom as well. Let's give ourselves a pretty aggressive amount of gain. And then open up this secondary parameter and play with this headroom control. You, as you can see at the bottom, we have kind of that kind of green section that is the safe space where you are exactly where you're supposed to be, like factory default basically. Or you can really kind of like over like overshoot your uh, your kind of like sensitivity and get a lot more gain out of it. Or go the opposite direction and really kind of like starve the circuit for for signal a little bit, which actually offers up a very different vibe, which is really cool. It almost takes it into like overdrive, low gain distortion territory. Okay, I swear we're gonna try to like go on as few tangents as possible, but let's pull up some delay and some reverb really quick because I feel like that's a great sound for uh, kind of like the end of the song uh, as you're headed into kind of like the sad soft ending of a track where you've got like That's pretty rad. That's a, I haven't found that really kind of like starved, underserved version of that fuzz before. And it's quite nice. Resetting back. Let's now jump down to Howl, which is going to be another fuzz, but a little bit more of like a resonant frequency fuzz. So in this one, amount is going to once again be the intensity of your fuzz. Tilt EQ is going to kind of like highlight more resonant peaks as you kind of move a filter through this fuzz.
Okay, because this one's got that frequency, that resonant frequency thing, let's go ahead and uh, kind of like twist in our first gesture of our of this kind of like section of our video. Okay, that's so weird that I actually have a better idea for that. That's really dope. Let's move on down to my favorite of these character modes. Of course it is. And that is Swell. Back up to full mix. Uh, amount is going to be the attack and release times and tilt is going to still just be your tilt EQ. So you can have kind of like mellower. Or bright ones that cut a little bit better. So obviously, if you're going to play like more violin-y, kind of Jeff Beck-inspired fast swells, you're going to want to bring it down to a lower amount. And of course, give it some delay and some reverb. We're going to pretend like that chord was on purpose. And the value of playing with that sensitivity in this mode is very much to kind of make sure that like if you're playing softer bits that they are triggering effectively. Yeah, swell mode. It's easy. It sounds great. I'm a big fan. And you'll hear in there, uh, the longer it takes to open is also the longer it takes to close, which means you got to give a little bit more space between your chords for really slow swells. And 
that is the character module. Let's take a look at this movement block. This is going to be a series of modulations of various kinds. You've got some traditional modulations, vibrato, phaser, and tremolo, but you also have a pitch block here as well as a doubler that is actually really interesting as it gets you from everywhere from kind of some very subtle stereo image widening stuff all the way out to borderline double tracking. Uh, your secondary parameters on this one are again going to be that effects volume, but you're also going to have access to a drift control that will do kind of like interesting fluctuations in speed and pitch depending on what block you are using in movement. So let's start things off with that doubler. So as you can hear at the outset here, Sounds mostly the same. And that's because rate is going to be the kind of like a, like the amount of time between your double tracking parts and the amount is going to be the mix of them. So as we turn this up, you will kind of get a greater amount of distance in between your double tracking parts, more time between the double and the original. And then the amount is going to be the mix of the two. Like I said, at the maximum there, you've got almost like a, a uh, kind of like a slap back thing. And then the mix. And your secondary parameter here is going to be a drift that creates kind of some like time discrepancies on that rate, allowing for some additional uh, kind of like momentary pitch modulations. <laughs> If you think of the double tracker as like a reel-to-reel -reel style tape double tracker, you can think of this as like crinkles in that tape. And you can bury them in that mix a little bit. And if you want added modulation there, you can go ahead and just kind of like screw around with that, uh, that rate control a little bit. Let's go ahead and reset all of our, all of our stuff. and jump on down to that vibrato. This one's pretty straightforward. Rate, depth. This one has an added benefit of uh, being two in one for an, for an effect because it's a vibrato. By dialing back that mix, you have a chorus, which is just, it's always nice to have. And 
your drift control in this one is going to be uh, some random pitch fluctuations like tape instability, uh, but it's also going to introduce a stereo width to your to your vibrato. giving us access to stereo chorus. Phaser is going to have a very similar control scheme with the rate at your kind of like phase shifting frequency and the amount is going to be the intensity and adds uh, kind of like additional stages to your phaser. Uh, drift is going to add a randomness to the kind of like pitch shifting waveform that is creating the phasing effect. <laughs> Because this one doesn't have a stereo kind of like component to it by nature. Let's go ahead, bring that microcosm back in just so you can hear how this phaser has the ability to still offer up some of that kind of like big lush drifting width to it. So this tremolo is really interesting because it's going to go from something that almost sounds like a bias trem in an amplifier, even though it's always amplitude, it sounds like a bias trem, really subtle at low settings, but goes up into like a hard choppy square wave at the, at the most extreme. And then the drift control is going to add random randomization to the tremolo that will also kind of hit differently on the left and right channels. And the complication of that, or the consequence of that, is you have two different ways to achieve random speeds in this tremolo. You can use the drift control to cause it to kind of drift from left to right and create like momentary stereo inconsistencies, or you can use those gesture controls to mess with the rate control and create kind of like 
uh, correct across the board. I don't know how, to, how, how else to say that. Left and right will be kind of like moving from slow to fast in time with one another. Okay, and last up, we have the pitch shift control, which is going to be like a lo-fi pitch shifter. Uh, rate is going to be what it is pitch shifted to. Amount is going to be the mix between your wet and your dry. Uh, we'll run through this really quickly so you can hear that it is, in fact, quantized to some degree, uh, largely chromatic. Like I said, it's a very lo-fi pitch shifter, so the tracking is a little bit laggy, and the and the uh, and the the accuracy is pretty good, if not drifting behind your playing slightly. And then your secondary control here, your drift is going to be a like quality reduction. Let's go back to a full wet. This is technically our pitch shifted signal. It's just not shifted.
you hear that little bit of warble, that little bit of kind of like warped messed upness. Take that, roll your your amount back for a little bit more of a blend. And you have a broken chorus sound. is our movement block. Let's take a look at our diffusion block, which is going to be, I think, I'm guessing most of you are coming here because you've either seen my microcosm video or just, you know, fell in love with this company because of the microcosm. And so this is going to be the block that probably the most closely resembles what it was about microcosm that struck all of us so strongly when it came out. The diffusion module is going to offer up uh, a series of kind of like wet effects. This is going to be more of your delays, your reverbs, and some of the more interesting takes on pitch shifting and, and kind of like granular effects, even though this is not a granular effect heavy style device. First up is going to be Cascade, which is basically a bucket brigade style analog delay, but with a little bit of like interesting character added onto it. This is also going to be kind of the more straightforward of the available uh, modules in this one, uh, this block, this cascade. Your time is going to be your delay time, amount is going to be your feedback, and it will self-oscillate, as you hear. And then your drift is going to be pitch warble and modulation. This is also uh, alongside with this previous one with the uh, the uh, the tremolo and everything, but we didn't really get into it. This is also where you start getting access to a tap tempo. And as you can tell, uh, time will function as a de facto subdivision control as well. So like one, two, three, four. You're still getting like six, sixteenths up there. You bring it over here a little bit more, tap in that same tempo. You get eighths, and now you get proper quarter notes. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward, sounds great. Let's bring in some of that modulation. So the quote unquote cleanest version.
And of course, you have the ability to make wild pitch jumps. And what's really wild about that, what I really love about that is, let's take it up to like noon basically, activate that gesture control and let it kind of live for a while. Huge jump to the top, let it live for a while. Just so there's like a ton of space in between those pitch jumps. And now we bring it back in. Okay, moving down to reels, which is going to be a kind of like well-worn, beat-up old tape echo. I mean, that could not sound more tape echo echoey out the box if you wanted it to. The drifting stereo image of the delays in this thing is something that I really, really love as well. So in this one, uh, the secondary, the drift is going to be a amount of kind of like added degradation to the tape, causing your repeats to kind of fade, like fall apart, fade away and, and kind of like lose their character over time. So let's go ahead and bring that to zero. Give ourselves a nice long delay time. You can hear that, it's like the tape itself is degrading. And the beauty of that is, once again, not to, not to harp on it for, for, for too many times in a row, something pristine and beautiful like microcosm. Everything sounds so beautiful.
Yeah, it's great. It's great. I really like a slightly more subtle version of that degradation. And then just having that as a... Oh, and it's worth saying that uh, in this in this and the other uh, diffusion modes, that effect volume is going to be... your mix control between your wet effect and your dry signal. Which of course can be further fine-tuned with that mix control. So you can kind of set that mix and then set these relative to that mix control, which is helpful for kind of balancing the amount of drive you want with the amount of delay you want with the amount of overall mix you want available to you in this pedal. So let's jump down to what is somehow our first reverb, which is going to be uh, kind of size, decay, and tonality of the reverb, and then your wet-dry mix. So this is one of the effects that will actually give you a full wet effect starting with basically like a small room sound and the reason that that sounds so different than is because we're not just increasing our decay time, we are changing the actual rooms being blended between in this reverb. So, you know, small recording studio style room. A nice lively plate, you can almost hear that transition happen right there. At its most maximum you, maximum, you have a pretty long decay time, but also a very smooth and diffused reverb. Again, multiple ways to fine tune that reverb. Secondary control on this one is going to be pitch modulation applied to the reverb.
if you've heard any sound samples from the Chroma console before now that reminded you in any way of the microcosm, collage is why. This is going to be the closest thing to something granular in this device. It's basically a looping delay that destructively edits your audio as you make changes to the knobs. So uh, saved gestures with the time control or real-time adjustments via MIDI expression or anything else will create kind of like half-speed, double-speed pitch changes, uh, will kind of chop up your signal even further, and your time is going to set the delay subdivision ranging from really short granular stuff up to really long, uh, the manual says basically loop length style phrases. The amount is going to be the amount of repeats and feedback. Uh, you can self oscillate in this one as you can with almost all of these uh, delay modes. And then the drift control is going to be uh, randomly adding double and half speed loops on top of the signal without making changes to that time control. So let's uh, put the amount at medium, and let's take that time to full to start this one off. And let's go ahead and introduce the really interesting aspect of this one. Let's go back to some of those longer delay times.
collage is a trip. It's one of those ones that uh, in a vacuum like this is a little bit uh, like not super easy to get your, your head all the way around, but, uh, but in a grander context really kills. with reverb. It's a beautiful one. Let's reset everything we just did to mess with it. And then let's jump down to reverse. Reverse is really interesting because it is at its core, a reverse delay, but with an added couple caveats. One is the delay time doesn't control the straight up just time of the delay. It does control the pitch. which you can then MIDI clock and or tap. And then the amount is going to be the blend of the two. So really, it's more of a single repeat. Kind of, you know, sustained for as long as you, as, as long as you hold it. So that's me playing out an entire chord, but if I just tap a note, However long it takes to play all of the audio back that I put in is how long it will play back for, obviously just depending on how big of a sample I'm giving it like this. your drift is going to be some really great pitch modulation. And of course, you can do things like drift down and then run back up to the top with your gestures. And now you can do some really weird. and that is the diffusion block. Wrapping this section up, let's take a look at our texture. This is going to be a lot more straightforward because all you have is an amount 
and an effect volume. Uh, this block is going to be a lot of finishing touch style effects uh, for this thing. Uh, by default, obviously, it goes at the end of the entire signal chain, but you can obviously reorder it and put it wherever you want. First off is going to be filter, and it is by default a tilt EQ style filter, but mine is currently configured as a low pass filter, and you can jump between a low pass, a high pass, and that kind of traditional tilt EQ by going into your effects setup control, which is pressing these two buttons together. and then turning this filter control to, de to determine the kind of filter you wanna use. Green is going to be that band pass, and we will leave it there for now. So you can hear the kind of like factory set version of the filter. And just for the sake of being able to hear this as we go, let's turn on our gestures and just sweep through this filter. and then exit gestures, and this way you can just kind of hear it automate as we go back and forth. But of course, we can go into that effect setup mode and jump over to my preferred, which is going to be that low pass filter. So now we have ourselves a low pass filter. And lastly, high pass filter. love it. None of these are too resonant. None of those are too uh, aggressive or kind of like synthy, but they all have just enough that that movement feels really pronounced and kind of sweet, which I really, really dig. Let's jump down to squash, which is going to be a compressor limiter. So it's going to be basically a very aggressive compressor. You'll hear it as we go. It's one of those effects that you'll want to kind of like balance with that effects knob. Uh, and it will start to kind of overdrive as you get to 100%.
lower settings, it can be a great kind of just like control module for the rest of what you're doing on this on, in this device. Like it's very squishy, which is where that mix control can come in handy again. Let's get into some of the weirder and more fun things in texture, starting with that cassette, which is going to be basically broken tape cassette style de uh, degradation of your signal. Uh, it's going to have everything you want, artifacts and compression and kind of broken pitch glitches and all that stuff. And it's going to happen in stereo, which is really nice. These texture ones are, are, like I said earlier, benefit a lot from that effect of volume control. And not to beat a dead horse too much. But I talked a lot in my two microcosm videos about my love for taking something like the microcosm and giving it to something that will kind of like mess it up a little bit. The microcosm has such amazing ideas in it and they're presented with so much kind of pristine clarity that sometimes you just want something to mess it up a little bit. That's pretty killer. Let's jump down to Broken. So Broken is exactly what it sounds like. Imagine your audio is running into some sort of analog machine experiencing a bunch of failure. That is what we're dealing with here. Uh, to kind of showcase that, again, I think we're just going to kind of start playing and then maybe just modulate the amount a little bit. Let's reset our 
our effect volume because this one is going to kind of create more dropouts rather than compressing and amplifying. So as you can hear, we're losing fidelity. We're getting some kind of like pitch and amplitude drops as well as some gaps in our signal. Interference is basically going to add a dissolving layer of uh, kind of just crap into your signal. I don't really know how else to describe it. It is an emulation and it kind of harkens back to like weird radio signals, ghosts in the machine, that kind of thing. Uh, it's going to sound like lossy. There's no getting around it. I mean, that's reductive, but that is a factor. signal while driving down the five. This video is clearly long enough, and I don't relish the idea of making it longer than it needs to be. But on our intro song, we did split, and I'm sure you noticed this if you were watching the actual camera angles, we did split up our sound samples for that song in between the kind of wide stereo digital direct rig that we are using for all those sound samples you've heard so far with the Ruby and the Microcosm and the Aux Stomp and all that with a handful of moments and more aggressive guitar parts that was the chroma console sitting on top of my matchless lightning amplifier right here. And that's because the chroma console has digital drives in it, but they sound really good. And I wanted to test them into a proper tube amp. So to kind of wrap things up and to give a little bit more context for the concept that we talked about earlier of chroma console as a kind of grab and go, pedalboard replacement in a pinch kind of thing. Let's go ahead 
grab the chroma console, stick it back on top of this amplifier, and just kind of turn some knobs and hear how it sounds into a proper tube amp in a mono environment with no other pedals. <laughs>
So if you made it to the end of this video, I, that's very impressive. This video was way too long, so thank you for sticking it out. Uh, if you want more of this kind of content, uh, if you want to talk to me directly a little bit more about Chroma Console and other gear or whiskey preferences or anything else, um, I have a link to my Patreon down below uh, that will give you access to my Discord community, a small, tight-knit group of awesome people who care a lot about these same kind of things. We talk music, we talk gear, we talk songwriting. Again, we talk whiskey. And uh, yeah, hopefully I will see you over there. Again, thank you so much for watching, and until next time.